realize though that technology is made by people. It has assumptions built in. Um, code libraries are built by people. Uh, code limitations exist because library limitation exists. Um, why is it that making something in the Macintosh graphically was easier than making it in Windows? Because QuickDraw on the Mac was a superior API by people who made a better API. So I began seeing how APIs really were the limitation for expression. Um, people think they're coding raw, but they're not. They have libraries that support them. Where is the control point began to become a question. Approach. Many things I made can't be seen anymore. They were on uh, Macintoshes uh, from the 68K generation. Uh, I've always tried to bring them back and don't know how to bring them back. And, you know, it's like they're like a DNR. So maybe, you know, it's supposed to be that way. Um, um, why do we use a keyboard? Why do we use a mouse? Why is there a microphone attached to the computer? Uh, it can take a video. Um, what do we assume we do with them? What happens if you erase all the letters on the keyboard? It becomes a tactile surface. What happens if you take the mouse and look at the optical sensor and shine it different places? And what is that device? Um, what is a microphone that you don't use to record voice but to just pick up sounds? What is video when it's just about intensity, seeking, searching? What can you make with it? Uh, what, what can you make on a rectangular screen and defy it, make it polar coordinates, make it 3D? I'm just playing around with that. For me, I was influenced by my kids who were tiny and, you know, they were, you know, babies, our babies, and they drool over everything. And so I would sit with my kids and just make, write code on the computer. And they began to see how I was making things. And I made this thing that responds to sound, uh, the reactive square, 10 squares that respond to sound, kind of an ode to Malevich. And my kids would make sounds like, you know, bah, bah, and the script would change. And they would laugh and be happy. And then one day we were at a computer store in Tokyo. And of course, I walk up to the computer and they begin making sounds like, ah, bah, you know, and, and nothing's happening, of course. And the computer person says, like, you know, what is wrong with your kids? And I began realizing that, oh, maybe there's a way to make things. And so I make things for my kids to play with. That's how it began. So I was making things, and I made this thing that responds to sound, uh, the reactive square, 10 squares that respond to sound, kind of an ode to Malevich. And my kids would make sounds like, you know, bah, bah, and the script would change, and they would laugh and be happy. And then one day we were at a computer store in Tokyo, and of course I walk up to the computer, and they begin making sounds like, ah, bah, you know, and, and nothing's happening, of course. And the computer person says, like, you know, what is wrong with your kids? And I began realizing that, oh, maybe there's a way to make things. And so I'd make things for my kids to play with. That's how, I'll never forget though, I was showing all this work. I used to lug my power book everywhere. And I was showing it in uh, La Jolla, I think. And um, I showed all my things and you know, I sit down and then this older illustrator, famous illustrator, whispers over to me after I've spoken, says, you know, your work, it's so empty. And I was like, wow, it's empty? And there were two people who said, no, no, don't listen to him. Your work is great. I was like, he said it was empty, you know? And I've been thinking, like, what, what is he talking about? I took it to heart um, because I felt it was empty as well. Um, it was amazing how, well, everything is in, inexact. Everything digital is kind of analog in a way because it's built in this analog world. And I began wondering what this world is. Uh, this world is composed of atoms and, you know, sensations, etc., but also people. I became very curious about people and how people work together or maybe work against each other uh, as a kind of exact. Everything digital is kind of analog in a way because it's built in this analog world. And I began wondering what this world is. Uh, this world is composed of atoms and, you know, sensations, etc., but also people. I became very curious about people. I became very curious about people and how people work together or may work against each other uh, as a kind of work to consider. That's when I got my MBA to understand how business seems to think it works. That's why I went to become president of a college to see what that's like, how that works, and to learn um, through the creativity I thought could be useful in this context. 
Simplicity is funny because people want simplicity, but once they get it, they get kind of bored. So they actually want complexity. And when they have complexity, they get overwhelmed and they want simplicity. So I always see it as we're going back and forth between two states all the time. That's why life is interesting. Otherwise, we'd get completely bored. And, and so because um, you can draw such beautiful pictures you now with a computer. It used to take like, I remember when I coded in PostScript, it would take like, you know, eight hours to render an image. And now it's like it happens in like milliseconds and I just marvel at it. Um, so InfoViz at the advanced end creates complex images that are either Cartesian or polar, whatever they are. They're beautiful. Do they communicate? Can they communicate? Um, I think people need to communicate to people. I'm a big believer that what we see can only go so far, but people can go the entire distance. People themselves are the greatest communicators around. And I have always believed I should stop making things because everyone can make better things than me now. It's like, oh my gosh. Back, back when I was making things, like no one could make them. And I had, my teachers told me to go on, to become an educator so I could educate students who could, who could one day surpass me to kill the master. And so that already happened like in 1997. I was like, oh God, I gotta stop doing this, you know? Um, but, and so I was spending every night writing a system uh, in Python. Um, I just want to learn things. I always found, found myself like four years behind my grad students. And I, was, I was trying to catch up, you know, and so I was making a system. And I wanted to make a system that wasn't just about computation. Uh, it was more about um, um, hand gestures, like, like drawings. And so I made a system that would encode my drawings and gestures and colors that I like, and it's poured into a vat. And I worked with that. So those series of um, pieces, there are seven of them. They aren't, they aren't on the web, so you can't see them, actually. Um, um, those things were all examples of a different technique I developed to make more human uh, view of what computation looks like, feels like. And, um, um, but uh, their attempts to, to express myself as a person, um, uh, they're limited vastly. Uh, they're not archived because I don't have some, I can't archive myself while I'm making stuff. And um, uh, they're ephemeral, really. And non interactive. No, I just, I just lost interest in, in interactivity. Um, one of my friends who runs a type director's club in Tokyo once said to me that interactive design is like a dog looking for a bone on the screen, sniffing around to see what to touch. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting perspective. And so I began just making purely non-interactive images in that series. And uh, I made seven of them and I stopped. And that before. And, and is everything supposed to be new? Well, if you're saying it's new media, it better be new. So I think today the challenge is how do you break free from our notion of coding, from this linear set of sequences of mathematical instructions? Um, I see this as a limitation, but no one seems to be like bothered by it as much as making exuberant graphical images, uh, which all tend to look the same today. Um, location. And these students knew no pain levels, and they were excited to use computation for expression. Every week I would see new kinds of work, whether it's semantic processing, leading to graphics, or interactivity in a weird dimension. And it was amazing because it was still new, using computation to express the human experience. Um, and that led to aesthetics and computation as our group name. I began to look for people who were hybrids who were coders, artists, artists, coders, and began to pull them together in a one space at MIT. And, and that group created, led this idea of computation and artists as doing the same thing and not a big deal. That was the whole point, it's not a big deal. Now it's like normal now, which is, I think is a success. So, yeah. So design by numbers was supposed to be the antidote to a fundamental problem, and that is that artists and designers hate mathematics. And also computation got too complex because to learn Java, you had to have like a phone book to program in Java. So 
Design by Numbers was a limited way to draw on the computer screen. Uh, 100 by 100 pixels, only drawing in gray, uh, black and white, and very limited in an English-like language. Uh, running in a Java application, so it was networked, and it was meant to sort of show how programming works if you've never programmed. And um, series came in, and then at one point they said, well, this doesn't like show color. It doesn't like, it's limited to this small screen. People want to make a bigger one. We have to make a better one. And yeah, I'm the professor, the students, like, no, 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 this is fine, this is fine. But sure enough, you know, you know, Ben and Casey are making this thing, and I'm like, well, what is this thing? And I'm like, well, you know, you know. And then I remember Ben was trying to finish his PhD. I said, Ben, you should like work on your PhD, not this processing thing, you know. I said, no, I love this thing, you know. And I always say that you, the, the student should never listen to the professor <laughs> because sure enough, processing like took off. Ben's, Ben's the ace. What surprised me most was the tenacity of Ben and Casey. Um, I knew they were like intense, but man, I mean, they are so intense guys. And um, it also showed that you could do, uh, you could have great teamwork. You know, when you're a creative person, making a team is kind of hard. So here were these guys, they were clearly, you know, super powered individuals. It's like Batman and Superman sort of like teaming up, you know, and they just went after it. Um, Casey developed the whole community side. Ben developed a graphics engine. It was like, you know, the proverbial Reese's peanut butter cup, you know, peanut butter chocolate just came together. I love how it's opened up a toolbox for so many educators and also practitioners. Um, and of course, it's gone beyond graphics, you know, it's mobile and it's like 3D, et cetera, situation, context sensors, et cetera. Um, I love that it built a community of people, and that's to Ben and Casey's credit. They weren't trying to make a great graphics system. They knew, because they're from your generation. Um, ACU was a graphics library that was built on the Visible Language Workshops API, which came before that. That was later now, and a bunch of people kind of like contributed to that library. And um, it just kind of leaked out. And that's a great thing, you know? Um, and um, I always believed that was an important thing, that things kind of accidentally fell out. <laughs> Intellectual property is important, I know that, but I did always believe that academia is an open system. And um, that's, again, a credit to the people who I worked with, the grad students. They saw the value of sharing. Uh, I agreed. I looked the other way. And i um, very happy with that. So the elements are so complex that even people who make these elements don't know how to use them. So when they share the recipes, they learn too. Um, and talent is a strange thing. Some people may be able to go so far and giving it away enables them to see what they couldn't see. Um, so like, I think that I felt happy that I didn't have to make things anymore because uh, I handed off a baton and someone kept going and I got to see what they do. So I think Your mentors? Um, I'm a big believer in education um, and mentorship. I had the chance of seeing some of the um, great design people um, as my mentors uh, who before dying sort of passed the baton to me and I want to hold true to that example is, and um, it's just funny to like sort of talk to like a super Yoda type person, you know. I said to me, um, I was looking like, you know, at his at his window, his window is a very modern house, and he designed it himself. And I'm looking at it, it overlooks the forest, and I said, well, how how much is your land? And he says, forever. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, are you lying? You know? Forever, as far as you can see, that's my. Anyway, he was kidding, of course. But I liked the that kind of thing. I, we were having like um, lunch because I I couldn't go get like a sandwich somewhere. So like, so uh, he says, "You want a sandwich?" And I said, "Yeah, I'm really hungry." He makes a sandwich, gives me a sandwich, and says, "You know, I didn't make a sandwich for everyone, you know." So uh, it was that nice kind of like, kind of like what do you say, bravado. 
but kind of making fun of himself, you know, like a, um, I'm just glad to be alive every day. And I'm curious about that fact and what I get to imagine by being alive. That's my driving force. Oh yeah, no, I, I've been lucky to have, uh, you mentioned mentors. Um, one important one is Mitz Kataoka. He's a UCLA professor emeritus. And um, he once said to me how, you know, John, life is lived in four quarters, um, zero to 25 years of age, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, 75 to 100. He said, John, don't forget that most people don't make it to the fourth quarter. And the third quarter is pretty hard because your body begins to really decay. And he said, you're in your second quarter. You know, make a difference in your second quarter. So yes, I, I think about that a lot. Like how much time do I have to make a difference in this second quarter? Um, it's prescient to me. Art and design. Well, it's funny because the other day I started drawing, and I'm like, oh, I forgot I can draw, <laughs> you know, drawing. And well, I'm better. Um, so I, I have moved from expression for expression's sake or expression to satisfy a client's need. Uh, I've become my own client. You know, how do I lead differently, uh, better or worse, with what I know about creativity and playing and, you know, being a an MBA type thinker, how do I balance all these personas and try to do the right thing? Um, um, what does it mean once you're like over it? Once we, what, coding isn't a big deal anymore. Like, you know, mobile isn't a big deal anymore. What happens then? Um, I think you can sort of turn your attention back to people because people are all around you, you know? Sure, you can like put a mobile phone in front of yourself and you know, hide behind it, but there's a person behind the mobile phone. There's actually not just one, but there's like hundreds of them. So how do you relate to people? How do you become a member of society? How do you make a difference with everyone there? Not just your Facebook friends and your Twitter network, whatever. How do you make a difference in your locale? It became a question I began to ask. And uh, when I read and focus. Oh, I read this article this morning about how to stop checking your mobile phone. Um, I thought it's pretty good. It says, number one, put your hands underneath your, your, your legs and just hold them there during the day. Now, the other apparently is to hold your ears, to kind of hold on to your ears. Uh, some kind of acupuncture pressure point prevents you from whatever, I have no idea, but um, we're so connected to these things and we feel lonely when we're not. So uh, I consciously battle with that. How do I be more connected here than out there. Um, I think everyone is dealing with this, with, with, with this now. Um, it's a great problem to have. You get to choose. You get to have that thing over there or this thing over here. How do you balance that? Do you think that this culture? Well, I'm delighted that design is in the foreground now. And I think a lot of it is because technology has run its course. We can do anything at any resolution, at any speed, at any scale. So how to do it is, has become less important than why do you do it. And so the why is driving things. And design, Absolutely. well, I like to say that art is making questions and design is making solutions. And the questions aren't digital. So how do you get in touch with the non-digital manifestations of art with technology, design with technology? And how do you build on that because that's a physical framework. It's a framework that smells like something. It's something many people can touch together. It's something you can actually put a pizza on top of and eat together <laughs> versus this world of the digital space, of the multi-connected, uh, which is powerful because you become omniscient. But at the same time, you can't touch anyone. You can't uh, you know, have a Slurpee with someone out there at the same time. So how do you understand that? build on this world and move this world a little further, but not all the way into that space because there's no one there but you really. Well, first of all, the work that I did in new media, is it good or not, is a question that others are trying to ask or will ask, and I don't spend too much time on that um, because I am curious about how do I spend energy on um, not preserving my work, but seeing the future. Um, um, 
So he was in the, he was in London with his wife, and they had this couples game. You know, couples have games. You know, this game was uh, every time we go into an antique shop, if we like the antique, um, we'll buy it. It is a good story. So they go into an antique shop, open the door, the old man walks out, and there's a cup there. Like, oh man, tell me about this cup. And they would say to them, um, it's old. Well, tell me more. It's really old. And then we go to every shop, the same thing. Like, tell me about this. Tell me the story about the damsel in distress. No, 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 it's, it's really old. So then he began realizing that the antique dealers sees the value as it's old. Kind of like himself as a new media artist saying, it's new. And he realized it isn't a question of new or old. It's a question of good. Is it good or not? Doesn't matter if it's new media or old media. The question of good is what I think is interesting, coming to the foreground now. Oh, yes. I see digital media maturing at a rapid rate. Um, um, it's agile because you aren't bound by the tool. You are more curious about the relationships, people you're meeting, things you're seeing, food you're eating. That's actually probably the biggest takeaway for you. And in your I think one important thing to me is to not allow the false assumption that programming is, 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 is the imperative, um, but it is important. Let me give an example. Um, I remember maybe 15 years ago, I was here on RISD campus. I was giving a lecture, and um, at the time I was done with the web. I was, did all my web stuff, and I was getting tired of the web stuff, and I, I talked about that and said, you know what, I'm gonna stop doing web stuff. You know, and then a, a young person came up to me after the lecture and said, I'm so glad that you're not doing web stuff because I don't understand it. So I'm going to be just like you. I'm going to like not even do it. And I said, you don't understand. I did it already. <laughs> I saw the limitations. I'm making a choice. So people who code and learn more about the computer or learn about sensors or whatever, the intent is to learn it, but not let it own you. Because you may start our group name and began to look for people who were hybrids, who were coders, artists, artists, coders, and began to pull them together in a one space at MIT. And restraints. I thought that constraints were important, but they saw that they, they were actually not good. And that's how it all took off. And what surprised I love that it built a community of people, and that's to Ben and Casey's credit. They weren't trying to make a great graphics system. They knew, because they're from your generation. And design. Well, it's funny because the other day I started drawing, and I'm like, oh, I forgot I can draw, <laughs> you know, drawing. And, well, I'm, I'm drawing diagrams of leadership, organizations, relationships, and I'm using that design ability and computation to understand how to I guess lead better. Um, so I, I think the meaning was, what comes after digital? Um, what is it? Um, is it analog, going back to analog? Um, to me, it's realizing that, you know, there was Nicholas's uh, book, Being Digital. There are people that have been digital. I guess they're called digital natives now. Um, what does it mean once you're like over it? What coding is, and so the why is driving things. And design, art, expression is all about the why. That's what's exciting today, I think. Also, you've said that framework. It's a framework that smells like something. It's something many people can touch together. It's something you can actually put a pizza on top of and eat together. <laughs> Versus this world of the digital space, of the multi-connected, uh, which is powerful because you become omniscient. But at the same time, you can't touch anyone. You can't uh, you know, have a Slurpee with someone out there at the same time. So how do you be different? It's gotta be human. These aren't like you know, uh, Max Headroom type people. <laughs> They're real people. They're being digitized in 2.5D like this. Um, it's a piece people can talk about and remember. And as soon as you're done and you open source it, other people can start doing it and playing with it. Um, you. Um, I'm very fixed on how digital people are becoming more human through this work. 
And when they realize that, it gets more interesting. It isn't about like commenting out 10 lines of bad code or fixing a file that doesn't convert properly and you like whack that file left and right and you like, you know, and then it deletes itself or whatever. That, those problems are so minor compared to the question of after this, will you guys have a good dinner? How was the food? Did you meet some interesting people? Um, that I find what every digital artist will find the same way that I think the new media artists of the time felt as well, carrying tape recorders you know, across Appalachian Mountains to record you know, uh, music people never heard of. And it's that kind of technology and, and art that's happening that we don't talk about, that I hope we talk about. So people who code and learn more about the computer or learn about sensors or whatever, the intent is to learn it, but not let it own you. Because you may find out that you want to be a painter instead, and that's okay, but you'll take what you learned in that and the people you met through it, and it'll be a wonderful life. There's nothing, nothing lost. But what is lost, if you're stuck in that world, you're coding 24 seven, you're friending people left and right and chatting with everybody, and you're stuck in there eating Cheetos and having like, you know, bad burgers, and like, you're sick, and like, that's not why we do this work. We do this work of making art, making designs, to connect with real people. And that's the joy of it all. Thank you.